evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Thank you for tuning again to this special edition of this program, sponsored by the National Black Wall Street Chicago and our National Black Wall Street Chicago Business Enterprise Program. I am your host, veteran activist Mark Allen, and chairman of National Black Wall Street Chicago. And first and foremost, let me just thank the people that have brought me back down here uh, to this TV network. Some of you may see my face and know that some years ago, we had one of the most popular TV shows on this station, myself, along with my late former business partner, Morgan Carter, the conversation started. We had a very popular show called the Omnibus Roundtable here. And so to be back in this seat again, talking directly to the people, bringing truth to power, if you will, I am just humbled to be back in this seat. And so first and foremost, we thank Sister Ernestine Stanberry and all those who were involved in putting me back here in this seat. And hopefully, by what you see here today, you'll want us to come back to be in this seat and to get you empowered in the spirit of the original Black Wall Street. And as we celebrate this 93rd year anniversary of the, one of the worst race riots on a community of black people in Black Wall Street of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Imagine, friends, 35 city blocks in a city of Tulsa, Oklahoma that burned down on, on May 31st and June 1st of 1921, burned down over 600 successful small black businesses hundreds of small businesses, hospitals, uh, stores, and, 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 and thousands of people working. We lost hundreds of lives. And so we think that if our ancestors back in 1921 could take 35 city blocks then, before you could text and tweet and, and do all these things we do today, and they could build over 600 black businesses, then we surely know that in this year, 2014, Black people have got the collective genius and the economic power to put ourselves back in what we used then to create, sustain, and increase our own business. And that's what we're doing in the legacy of Black Wall Street and our business enterprise program where we build capacity to do what? There's some phrases you're gonna hear from us called economic violence. And what does that mean? It means that for God to give us a trillion dollar Consumer spending power, well, it's economically violent, friends, to have a trillion dollar power, and yet we keep, praying, we keep crying broke, if you will, because we don't have enough legitimate jobs to sustain our own people so that they've got to go to the illegal gang, drug, and other street economies to make a living. And I tell you now, trust me, over 90% of our people who are involved in the criminal justice system, friends, are there because of what? They got caught doing something illegal, trying to do what? Solve the economic problem. So that's the challenge of those you, that are us here at Black Wall Street, and that's the challenge to you, the viewers, that we're dealing with. And we're gonna bring people to you to speak truth to power, who know, his, who know the history and who know what we've been through and know where we should be going to help educate you on how you can take the pain of what you hear from this truth and use it for the power. And so one of the people that we're gonna talk to today who can help us look at why are we in a city that's 40% black population and still the majority of our people are not working with dealing with this economic violence? And it's economically violent to have a majority black community with all these black elected officials. There's not one Chinese alderman, and I'm not mad at the Chinese, but there's not one Chinese alderman. But how is it that you ain't building nothing in the Chinese community? without the active and systematic involvement of the Chinese community and their people. So how in the hell, or how in the heck I should say, if you will, do we have all these black elected officials in power today, and yet we still today can see in majority black communities more people working than us, and we gotta break through these cycles. And so economic violence is a phrase you're gonna hear. You're gonna start hearing things in our community called section three. What is that? You're gonna start hearing a thing called housing receivers. What does that mean? And then you're gonna start hearing more about what you can do. And that's part of our business enterprise program at National Black Wall Street Chicago. So again, we're glad we're here. But today, let's get right to it. Let's talk to one veteran activist in our community who we've come to know and respect for his knowledge and wisdom on issues and can help us get to the bottom and to the truth. But I tell you now, don't hear this truth, friends, and don't be prepared to act. And that's why we're here. So, but right now, I want to welcome a longtime friend of our community and an activist. Some of you know him in a lot of different situations as an activist. Some of you may know him 
as a, as, a, as a nominee for political office. He's been that, but he's still been a friend through the community through it all. And so whether he's an activist, whether he was a Republican nominee for Congress and for office, he's still been a knowledgeable one in our community that we should go to. So let us welcome our friend, activist, Paul McKinley. Thank you very much. Thank you, my friend. So, so let's get down to this. Now, in this economic violence, in a lot of our poor communities, there's no bigger issue that's getting ready to go down. And, and on, there's no place else in Chicago to build but the South and the West Sides. And so we've got people who've been moved. We've got development getting ready to go on. And yet still, why is it that majority black people are not working in majority black communities? And i tell you this real quick, Paul. I heard Reverend Jackson say something a couple of weeks ago when I was over at Rainbow Push with him, and he said it's interesting. We were at a time when we won more when we didn't have any power. Now we've gained power and have lost everything that we won with the power. I mean, how in the heck is that? But I mean, so well, tell us well, what you all, see from an activist standpoint as to why are we in this condition right now in majority black communities as we get ready to see billions of dollars being spent on housing and jobs. So you tell us what you see. First of all, Malcolm X said when Martin Luther King was marching, he said that you will end up doing a great disservice to our people. Half freedom is worse than being in bondage because a half free man think he's free. And he'll, oh, he'll fight with you harder about that he's free than a person that's in bondage. A person in jail knows he in jail, but a half free man, you can't trick him. He, you, 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 you done tricked him in believing that he's free. First of all, let me start off with our communities. Chicago, there's 42%, despite the, the low numbers, and uh, just like uh, African Americans left Chicago, uh, Latinos left Chicago, and white folks, everybody left Chicago, because of the economic uh, in the city of Chicago, especially behind uh, Ron the Tyrant Mayor. So a lot of them left the community. In our community, most of the development has been in our community. Most of the development is on the west side and most of the development is on the south side. Even the development that's on the north side is in black areas, even on the north side, or, or in the Puerto Rican neighborhood in Humble Park area, or Humble Park West. Uh, I would like to first start off with the uh, CHA project. I would like to start off with what they called, and they used the terminology loosely, the transformation plan. First of all, CHA receives $1 billion every year. Uh, 80%, 82 to 88% of all CHA residents who live in uh, affordable housing, I'm not talking about the voucher system per se, but I'm talking about in all the public housing were African Americans. But yet, 80% of all landscaping that's done on these same properties are Latinos. Now, the reason why that happened is because CHA has went as far as they can go to make sure that the residents did not participate in the development of their community. And it goes like this, it's very simple, and I want the audience to hear how all this went down. But wait a minute, let me, tell you, let me stop you for a minute. So when you say 80% of the housing residents in CHA right. were African American, were black people. Right. And yet when it comes down to spending hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in landscaping dollars. Just, just very, very simple stuff, stuff that you don't have to go to college for, you don't have to speak the language. You get behind the line more. And, and I'm saying these are the same black communities where black people move snow from in front of their houses every, every winter. This is the same black communities that black folks been cutting grass. But when it come down to black folks doing something and being paid for it, they still have this program where they'd rather pay other ethnic groups who are not legal, 
who are, and I'm specifically uh, targeting the Mexican community because those are the ones that they bring in. And even though they may bring in white companies, they make sure that they bring Mexicans in in our community. And so the Mexican community can, can, can cut grass in their community and they can come in our community and cut grass and make money off our people. At the same time, this caused violence, it caused strife, and some of them bring dope in our community. And as you notice that the, all of the narco terrorists come through them. So, uh, uh, and, and our suspicion is, is that a lot of these companies are laundering money, cleaning up the money, using federal dollars and using federal contracts contracts to clean up the money. But I really want to get back to the transformation program to uh, let the audience know uh, the, the role that this mayor has played in the transformation plan. The transformation plan goes like this. Most of the people that lived in the projects are uh, Stateway, uh, Agel Gardens, uh, 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 Rockwell Hornets, uh, 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 or if I, uh, Robert Tell, if I, if I miss some of the projects, no, excuse me, uh, most of these projects were almost 100% black. There was no other people, ethnic group in there. And in these projects, these were the poor people. These were uh, not necessarily the working poor, the real poor. In other words, the whole hood was on ADC. Some people only could pay $20 a month rent. They was really poor in them projects. And they came up with a program called the uh, Section 3. Section 3 is a clause in a development, in the CHA law, that says that if there are any development with their construction dollars, where they're doing any development, that the residents who live in these, these areas, who live in these projects first, must participate in the development of the community. It's a very clever and wise thing that you take the people who have the less, who have hardly no skills, and the construction industry is very uh, uh, I illiterate friendly. You don't have to have, have a lot of sense. Just do the work. That's right. They got a lot of people that come from other countries that can't even read and come right into America, and you'll see them. They're working in our communities now. And so this clause in Section 3 is a federal mandate. It's a federal mandate by uh, 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 HUD that they and must do this. And this federal mandate should be held accountable by our federal officials and we the people. That's right. Hold, hold that thought right now, because I know you got something to say. I got something to say. Friends, we're going to talk about this thing about Section 3, what it was supposed to mean for our people, what it has not meant for our people, and how that has led to so much of our physical violence. We're going to come back and deal with this economic violence and uncover this Section 3 piece. We'll be right back in a couple of minutes after we take this break, but we'll be back for this, so stay tuned. I like that commercial. Welcome back to the second segment of this program. Again, thank you for tuning in. I'm veteran activist Mark Allen and chairman of National Black Wall Street Chicago and our National Black Wall Street Chicago Business Enterprise Program where we focus on, in the spirit of the original Black Wall Street, how to create, sustain, and increase our own business in our own community within our own power. We were talking to veteran activist Paul McKinley in our first segment, and we're gonna get into the seg second segment of one, how in the black community where we deal with this transformation of housing from public housing, CHA, and under the leadership of now Mayor Rahm Emanuel and the role he had to play in this transformation of housing. And more importantly, how did 80% of the people who made up Chicago public housing that a former mayor like Harold Washington said, I guarantee you that under this mayor, the very people would be empowered to build where they live and where we expand and now all these years later, development is going on, people are making contracts, people are working, but it's something called Section 3 that we were talking about in our first segment. What the heck is Section 3 in terms of its capacity to allegedly supposed to have empowered the very people? How did the Section 3 program that was designed to empower the 80%, 90% of black 
public housing residents to build and work and contract where they live to now you've got CHA housing being built in majority black communities that majority black people can't work. So tell us, Paul McKinley, more about the meat of what is this section three and why has it not been what it's supposed to be? You have to understand the, the transformation scheme. It was never, it was, a, it was a, the, called the transformation project and it was being a scheme played out on black folks. And first of all, most of all these areas that I'm talking about are, have black aldermen. Aldermen have to sign off on all these programs. The, 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 the transformation plan was to take the people out to projects because the projects were very violent and they had been abandoned by HUD. They weren't abandoned by the people. The people was in the projects abandoned. And so they was left to uh, live under tyranny in these, in these projects. And the tyranny part is that they disarmed them. And what they did was they passed a law saying that if you was a CHA resident and you was a law-abiding citizen, you couldn't have a gun. So they disarmed. So if you got a building with 17 uh, floors or 16 floors, one of them tall buildings, and you got some guys at the bottom of the building that want to do all kind of stuff, they ain't worried about you because the law say you can't have a gun, Mr. Law-abiding citizen. And all mm -hmm. that was done from the city of Chicago. That wasn't done from uh, no, what did no gang pass no law saying that. That was done by your mayor and this and all the and, and this and this other mayor is trying to disarm the public too. Now let me get back to the transformation plan. What they did was they said we're going to tear down the projects and we're going to build new housing. And, and, and so what they did was they dispersed the people. Where they sent the people to Inglewood, Roseland, Lindale, Austin, uh, uh, South Shore area. Those are the areas that you've seen a spike in the violence. If you own property over there, it's directly because of the mayor. If you go own property over there and your property went down, it's directly over the mayor. Now, a lot of people claim that when they gave people uh, Section 8 vouchers, that they uh, moved in and destroyed their properties. But first of all, let me say this to you. They had what they call a program called the Hope Six. Hope Six was socially engineer these people. These people have been living under the tyranny of a, 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 a hellish program in the city of Chicago by a mayor that, that, that pulled the police back. And even when they had CHA police who would govern the projects, this mayor, or, or Mayor Daly, pulled those police back and left the people at the, at the mercy of them who did not have no mercy. Oh, and, that's, and so when they moved these people into the working class community. Now they didn't move them to uh, to, to 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 Chatham. They didn't move them to Beverly Hills. They didn't move them to uh, out there in 18 Ward to uh, Evergreen Park. They didn't move them over there. They specifically moved them and they steered them. This is the language that they use in the real estate industry. They steered them to those areas. When they steered those people to those areas, they moved them into the working poor. Now these are the working poor people. They are, they folks that got jobs, they rent 500, 900 a month in these areas, and they immediately start getting into it with the people who came from the projects. And, and the first sign of the violence, the first real sign that it was real violence was the, uh, the violence that happened in the schools. If you notice, they start having real violence in the schools in 04, 05, 06, then when you get to 07, you, you, you have a, 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 what they call mini riots. You start having mini riots in the school with the kids that come from the projects. And you start having, and these kids are being, uh, trying to be preyed upon, and these other kids is banding together. And, and all this happened because of the transformation plan. Now, had they had section three and took the residents First of all, they had Hope Six money, and they could have socially engineered them and showed them how to live in their house. Because they had never lived in houses before. Don't get it twisted. They never lived in, they only lived in public housing, in a hellish condition when they lived in that. But when they moved into these communities, they was, they was, the, the federal government was obligated. Since you messed these people up, since you uh, put these people in, in these hellish conditions, you is up to, it's your, it's, it's by law, you're supposed to straighten this out. Like you did in Iran and Iraq and Vietnam and all these different countries. When you had war on those people, you came back and built those people up. And then those people participated in the development. What happened was that the residents, while they were bi building on State Street, while they building over there in Rockwell, while they was building over in the Hornets, 
while they building over in Agile Gardens, they made sure that they excluded the residents and gave those lucrative contracts to, once again, to the same people who didn't have nothing to do with trying to straighten the project out. And then, at the same time, they gave money to nonprofit organizations. These is what you call the 501C complex. Like you got the military complex, you got <laughs> the 501C industrial complex in Chicago with the Negro preachers. There's a difference between a Negro preacher and a preacher that loves God and his people. So we're not talking about the preacher that loves God and his people. We're talking about a Negro preacher. And those Negro preachers receive monies. They receive millions of dollars to stop the violence in the community. They receive millions of dollars to go out and talk to the people and straighten the things out. But they, when they got the money, they kept the money and they bought brand new Cadillacs, they bought brand new stuff, what Negro preachers do. So there's a what? difference between a Negro preacher and a preacher that loved God and his people. And so now there's an investigation on these preachers and on these different Negro preachers who received this money $54 million, and they're not, this ain't the first money that they got. They had been getting the money, and they was never straightened the project out. So when y'all saying, why we have violence in the community, them people receive the monies. And if you want to go and look up the name of the people that receive the money, it's on Criminal Justice Information Authority. It's on the governor's website. You can pull up. And you can see your local pastor who was receiving the monies and, and other people say that they wasn't taking the money to stop the problem. They were taking the money to keep quiet. This is hush money. Look on this website. Go to the governor's website and look on this. Go to uh, the people that are doing investigation and pull this money was for these preachers to be quiet while they give all the jobs, contracts, and opportunities away had they been no. given the people. So the like very people, say. right, who can do that? Because I'll say that. Well, one thing I must say this, out of the spirit of one of my elder teachers in this movement, the late Archesia Randolph, she would always tell me, don't use the word project, we're developments. And so I'm gonna use the word in her spirit, development, first thing. Second thing, as a former activist myself, I ain't new to this. I've been doing this 40 years myself. And grace be to God, we've survived a whole lot of stuff. But one of the things that always disturbed me, well, one thing, I haven't seen the list, but I'm just saying the only thing that disturbs me about the list, it almost took me 20 years to realize that, you know, I kept saying, well, if you train me to help one somebody, I did good. But I finally realized while I was saving one, I lost 99. Right. So why, why am I not being trained to save the 99 and I might have lost one? Which means you can't get around this economic problem. And one of my frustrations, and why I stopped being a crime intervention specialist, a intervention specialist, an interrupter, all this, man, I got time 24 seven, all I was being paid to do was break up fights. When, when, and so now I wake up every day saying, here's how many fights I broke up. But one thing I never resolved was the root of why I was breaking up the damn fights in the first economic place, and that was violence. the people's economic problem. That's and that's right. economic violence. And so the only problem I got, I've had grant money myself, but the only problem is I've learned to the point that you try to tell people, you can't just get $50 million to break up fights. That's right. Because you're gonna come back to the same, look, you, you come back, sister, why are you prostituting? I'm trying to solve an economic problem. Brother, why are you still in tires? I'm trying to solve an economic problem. 90% of our people are in the criminal justice system today, friends, because they got what? Doing something illegal, trying to do what? Solve their economic problem. And so the point is, you can't stop physical violence if you're not stopping economic violence. And so when you mention the only problem I got, shoot, governor, if you invest in the people, fine. But my only problem is, is that I've only seen three or four groups who got the 50 million. I saw Father Flager, St. Sabina. I saw the Black United Fund of Illinois. I saw a couple of others saying, here's the money we took and here's the people that we served. So that's a few million. Where in the hell did the other 50 million go? And we got to be accountable for that. They're right here. And, and we I'm need to. asking that the public Go see for yourself. It, it, you may, it may be your pastor. If you notice 
that this economic violence is rooted in money. I'd like for the audience to hear what I'm finna say because this is very important. We don't have a church problem. Black folks got more churches in Chicago than they got in Bethlehem, and Jesus was born there. Well, let's so do we this. Hold on. I, I, I know we're going to do one more segment, friends. I, I know you're listening and you want to hear. We're going to do one more segment on this. We're going to come back. We've heard the problem, and as we talk about it, Black Wall Street, here's the solution. And part of it now is building the capacity of the right kind of people to do the right thing for the right reason. Friends, we'll be right back to deal with how do we solve our own problem with our own resources and deal with this section three piece, how to resolve it. We'll be back for this one more segment. Stay tuned. Friends, welcome back to this final segment and thank you for your support because now we had to do one more segment to get this in. Because in the first two segments of this issue, we've talked about the problem, whereas here's the problem, the problem of uh, over 80% of black people coming out of Chicago public housing, but 80% of black people were, who promised was not fulfilled when it came to being able to build and live and work in the redevelopment of that same public housing as we move in these black communities. And so we've got the problem that the, that the savior for all this was something called Section 3 that was supposed to empower the community to be empowered as contractors. Section 3 was supposed to empower uh, uh, other local vendors to be able to build where they live. However, the masses of the people have been left out. So we got to tie in where our religious leaders fall in, where the politicians fall in. Because I got a freaking problem when I understand fighting white contractors who come in the majority black community saying, here's why majority black people ain't working. But I got a doggone problem, if you will, with black contractors and black people trying to explain why people are dying, why we can't work. And I'm telling you, friends, we got to go back to the days of when there wasn't no law. As Reverend Jackson said last week, we won more when it wasn't no law and didn't have no power. Now we got the power and losing every damn thing we didn't fought for. So we got to go back to when it wasn't no law, when our moral authority, Dr. King said, I don't care what the law said. If we don't work, nobody work. That's right. And don't tell us we ain't prepared. So National Black Wall Street and the National Black Wall Street Business Enterprise Program, we're going to tell you in a minute how we're going to be working to build the capacity Paul McKinley already told us how the Section 3 was set up. So why hasn't it not worked for black people and what we got to do to make it right? And so we're going to deal with that because as we lay out the solution, first two segments, talk about the problem. Now we're going to get to the solution. And the solution just ain't us, friends. The solution is, what are we the people going to do? What happened to we the people we've been looking for? We the leaders we've been looking for. We're going to get to that. But, Paul, let's finish this up because I want people, we've heard the problem all day long. Here's where the rubber meets the road, as Milton Carter used to say. Now that you know what the problem is, here's what the solution is. And you can't text and tweet your way through this. You got to get up and fight. And first, so, first tell us, so bring.